Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Lutheran Church on this fine Sunday. I'd like to thank all of you for being with us here today. It is the sixth Sunday of Easter. Is that right? I should have wrote that down. It is. The sixth Sunday of Easter. Um, I want to thank all of you who are watching with us online. Uh, just so you know, we do have a, a test congregation, a beta test sort of congregation to, to test out our, uh, our distancing and our, our things. We are ready to get back on the services on 31st. That's sort of the, uh, the, 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 what most of the churches are doing. Uh, they're coming back on the 31st. That will be Pentecost Sunday. So don't forget to, to, wear, to wear your red. Um, other than that, we begin our service in earnest this morning with our opening hymn, Lord, Keep Us Steadfast in Your Word. It is 655. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The three sad days have quickly sped. He rises gloriously from the dead. All glory to our risen head. Alleluia. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Even as the glory of the gift of eternal life. In that hope, we spend our days in joyful repentance and faith. Let us confess our sin, the sin that still so easily besets us, and receive the full forgiveness of our Lord daily provides for us. Lord God, through the strife is over, the battle done, and now is the victor's triumph won. Sin still hangs on us. We are your baptized people. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us into our Easter joy. Upon this, your confession, I by virtue as my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord 
help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you who take away the grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your mercifully guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our reading. The first reading from Acts chapter 17. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in a synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they, and they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus and saying, may we know what this, what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of our own poets have said, we are indeed his offspring. Being in God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Peter. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile you, revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in person in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the verse and the hearing of the Holy Gospel. Hallelujah. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Alleluia. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth of whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while in the world you will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live also you will live. And that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Please be seated for our hymn of the day, How Clear Is Our Vocation, Lord. It is 853.
Grace and mercy to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our sermon text is from the book of Acts. We pick up from the previous reading. Paul is alone in the city of Athens, but awaiting Timothy and Silas. And while he is in the city, his spirit is provoked within him. Because Athens is a city is filled with idols. It's recorded of Athens at the time it was easier to find a god in Athens than it was to find a man. You see, Athens was a religious megalopolis. It was filled with people, and it was filled with people throughout the world, and they had brought all of their religions and their deities, and the Athenians prided themselves on this. They thought they made this make them more spiritual. They prided themselves on giving everyone their say and everyone had their day and everyone had their way. They're what we might have called in our day a multicultural city. By the way, it wasn't what you would call true tolerance. It was on the Athenians' parts more like a muted condescension of their views. But Athens was one of the few places where Paul was not persecuted. They only laughed at him. Paul starts his trip to Athens in the synagogue, as was his practice. There he preached to the Jews and a few Greek God-fearers. Some of the Epicureans and the Stoics were there as well. And upon realizing that he was a foreign missionary, they invited him up to the Areopolis in order to spread his teaching and, and share that with the group. He did that. Paul stands in front of them and proclaims this wonderful, well-thought-out and rational argument for God. He says, Men of Athens, I perceive in every way that you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found an altar with an inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim unto you. What in the world is the purpose of an altar to an unknown God? <laughs> you don't know? This was sort of their just-in-case altar, right? Just in case we've missed somebody. We have a phenomenal collection of gods in Athens, but we might have missed one, so uh, you can, we have a vacancy, oh, unknown God. The real purpose of an altar to an unknown God is because man had fallen into sin and they can send you to sin and they walked away from the path of the known God and as time went on, these Athenians, these Greeks forgot all about God. But God did not forget about us. God placed within mankind a natural knowledge of himself. Man has always known of the divine. God has always known of the spiritual realm. We always know the things that are seen, but we also know that there is a realm of unseen. And we understand that. The only one who has ever gotten away with this and, 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 and rejected it is, is so-called modern man. But mankind still knows the divine. We understand the difference between right and wrong. We understand that evil opposes good at every turn. And so mankind knows if you break the divine law, there will be repercussions. Some of the pagans even put a, a whole philosophy around this. They call it karma, right? Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad in this life or the next, one facet of the natural knowledge of God. That if you do wrong, you feel guilty about it, and you are going to come under condemnation. You are going to be punished, and you deserve it. Natural man knows if by instinct the divine and the divine law. If you do wrong, you're going to feel bad about it. And natural man does not like to feel guilty about anything. 
And since how we know that we are all born sinful, sinful from birth, and we continue to sin throughout all of our life, and we don't like feeling guilty about it, we have to do something about it. Natural man tries to work that off himself. Of course, this only really works if you're the kind of person who's able to be truthful with yourself. Many people say, well, I'm a good person. Well, you know what? It's easy peasy to say I'm a good person. Anybody can say, well, I'm a good person. I'm sure Hitler thought he was a pretty good dude. Anybody can say they're a good person. Number one, I've taught what it is to be good. That's basically just being polite. And we also live in a society where bad behavior is punished. So we live somewhere between the rock and the hard place of being as polite as we have to be without being punished. And then we give ourselves bonus points, right? I didn't steal anything this week. Although I, I really, I have all that I need. I didn't cheat on my wife this week, who loves and adores me and cares for me. Hi, Steph. I didn't punch anybody in the face this week. Because assault is, has fines or jail time, which tends to help. Natural man way overestimates their value of their goodness and then they minimize or ignore altogether their sin. So when guilt enters in, and it will, man naturally seeks a place to work off his debt. Good works, moral endeavors, helping children, giving to the poor, worship. This is what the Athenians are doing. They have lots and lots and lots of idols. They have lots and lots and lots of education. They have lots and lots and lots of philosophy. All of these are cerebral inventions of their own mind or somebody else's. They have an international collection of deities. And apparently, it has not yet solved their guilt because they have this just-in-case altar to an unknown God. Just in case. Something on some level has pressed them to erect this shrine, this just in case altar to an unknown God, to the one that they had forgotten about, the one who had made heaven and earth, the one who had made the matter and the dark matter and the seen and the unseen. Paul proclaims this unknown God unto them. The God who made the world and everything in it. The Lord of heaven and earth. This unknown God. But he is not like the other gods. He does not live in shrines made by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. He is the one who gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. And so Paul explains that this God has life in himself. That man and animals and vegetable life is all derived from the life that he gave. And it comes to us from the author of life. Who is the author of that divine law. That life, that still life is derived from him. Even the sophisticated enlightened man agrees. That life has to have a reason. Life has to have a cause. You can call it the Big Bang if you would like. But there's still that, that natural knowledge of God that this had to have had some sort of start. From one ancestry made all the nations. That the races can intermingle and cross-pollinate proclaims the oneness of the human race. Paul alludes to the fact that the divinity has been in, at work in human history. He allotted their times of their existence and their boundaries and the places where they would live, when and where and why. In verse 27, so that they would seek God. The hope that they might feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he's not actually far from any of us, says Paul. For in him we live and we move and we have our being. Even some of your own poets have said that we too are his offspring. This omnipotent, 
ruler, creator, benefactor, the Lord God Almighty, the maker of heaven and, and earth. This God is that absolute that those Athenians feel deep within their heart. Paul continues, And since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think of a deity like silver or gold or stone or an image that has been formed by art or by the imagination of some mortal. Again, we return to Paul's original premise. What on earth is the purpose of you putting in your city an altar to an unknown God? This huge collection of deities has not solved your guilt problem. And so you, you Athenians, have left room for the just in case. And now Paul cuts to the chase. Why is he unknown? God does not want to be unknown. God wants to be known by you and to you and for you. At some point along the way, they had lost him. They had at some point forgotten God. At some point, they thought something was too important or more important than God, and they simply walked away from him. But God, who they do not know, has seen fit to bless them with a natural knowledge of himself so that they might seek him, that they might turn to look for him, and in the seeking, that they would be able to find. Now Paul's rational argument is over, and he continues. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, he now commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness. Come back unto God. Repent of your evil deeds. The kingdom of God is drawn nigh. Now is the day of your salvation. Now is the day of the Lord. There's no refutation from the Athenians recorded. None is needed. He has given assurance to all of them that God has raised Christ from the dead. And that's the point where the Athenians check out. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, they mocked him. He was doing just fine right up until this point. And this is where these sophisticated men of reason and logic cracked up. They couldn't take it anymore. The resurrection from the dead? At this, they scoffed and they mocked. And Paul simply states what we would call a fact. A fact based on nothing more than the, the recorded record handed down to us by our forefathers. A record that they saw him from Mary and Peter and John and Simeon and Thomas and all of the witnesses of the resurrection who said we were witnesses. We saw him alive. He is risen. After this wonderfully laid out and well thought out argument for Christ our Lord, Paul can give them no other proof to offer. There is no other proof that he can give. There is no other proof that he can give unto you, and there's nothing that you can give unto anybody else. You don't have any proof that he rose from the dead. You have faith, which is far more superior in the eyes of man. You are the proof. Your life your faith, your appearance here today, you are the proof. Now some of them scoffed at the resurrection of the dead, but some of them, a very small sum of them said, yes, we will hear more about this in verse 33. At that point, Paul left them, and some of them joined Paul and became believers, including Dionysius and a woman named Damaris and others with them. We all know what Paul knew. We all know what Paul knew. 
that God is not unknown. He is known. He has made himself known in natural understanding of himself. He has made himself known in scripture. He has made himself known in the breaking of the bread. He has made himself known in the washing of the water. He has made himself known through the preaching of the gospel. He desires to make himself known. And he continues to pound upon unrepentant hearts and consciences that he is real, that there is a day of reckoning to come, that there is a time when the world will be judged in righteousness and he does so for their benefit so that they may feel that empty hole in their life that they may search and grope and perhaps find him and he is not far from each and every one of them people are supposed to seek God they're supposed to grope for God And he makes himself known through you. You are the proof of the resurrection. You are the irrefutable. You are the unarguable. You are the witnesses of these things. That God desires to be revealed and he will. And he'll be desired. And he will be revealed through your actions and through your ministry. Which is why it's so important us to remember Peter's words. Be prepared to give an answer to those who ask of the reason of the hope that you have. You are all unto the last man prophets of the Most High God. You are a holy nation. A royal priesthood sent throughout the world to proclaim the majesty of God. To proclaim that he is not lost, that he is not unknown, that he desires to be found. And he can be found where he has promised to be in word and sacrament ministry. On any of a thousand altars throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us rise. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we give you thanks and praise for the new life and salvation with which you have brought beauty into our lives and our world again through the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray that you open the ears of all who hear your word that this salvation come to many in true repentance and faith, a gift of your own Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Send your Spirit mightily, especially upon those called to preach, proclaim, and teach your life-giving word. Guide all pastors, teachers, and servants of the church to be faithful in word and deed. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. To all who bear the authority of government in our land, give your blessings and tranquility and peace to rule our days. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. When suffering for your truth comes our way, remind us of the certain victory that is ours by our baptism into Christ. Give us the vision of your mercy and grace that we endure any opposition to the true faith. Lord, in your mercy, visit with peace and healing all who suffer illness or injury, 
or any painful difficulty. We pray for the members of our congregation who continue to receive cancer treatments for Albert Parrish and Peggy Polomsky, Terry Sheldon, Brad and Donna White, and David McElfresh. We continue to pray for leaders of our country, those who are on the front line fighting the COVID-19 virus, for Janice's sister Lois, and for Steve Robertson who continues to have testing on the term and the best way to treat his colitis. For Maria Parrish, who will be having surgery on Monday. For Jim Clowney, who's recovering from his shoulder surgery. For Martha Hicks, Hicks, who sustained an ankle injury after a fall. For Jeannie Mayer, who's having problems with her hemoglobin and cellulitis and, and, and dizziness. For Lois Tomlin's stepsister, Sue. For Melody Frank's niece and her family, Casey May, after the sudden passing of her husband, Warren, this last month. For Connie Anderson, the daughter-in-law of Carolyn Cooper. We pray for Casey Hutchins, the two-year-old great-grandson of Marso Martha Sylvester, who broke his arm and had elbow surgery on Tuesday the 24th. For Esther, who's now recuperating at home after injuring her back and her arm. For Charlie Messersmith's mother, Elvira, who fell and had surgery on a broken femur, and she continues to recover at home. For Christine Smith's mother, who fell. For Landon Beers. For Joanne Zaberski, who's suffering severe back pain down her leg and has had shots for her back. For Mark's son, Sue. Or for Sue's son, Mark, who's been deployed to the Middle East. And for Helen's sister, Linda, who continues her battle with cancer. Let not your hearts be troubled or weighed down with any fear, but lift your eyes so to share to the sure and certain promises of eternal life and joy. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. I render to the Lord The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn, Alleluia, sing to Jesus. It is 821.
please be seated. Just a couple of announcements before I dismiss you. Um, I don't really have any announcements other than the fact that pretty much the whole world has been canceled for seven weeks. Um, the church will be coming back together for our first service on uh, uh, the May 31st. That's Pentecost Sunday. We're going to be calling the congregation, asking you to, uh, uh, we've got a, a whole list of things that we can do, but we're going to be asking you to tell us which service you would like to come to for the next couple of weeks. We're going to do four services. We're going to try to keep those services to 40 people or under. We think we can do that pretty easily. Um, but again, you'll, you'll hear from the, the, the pastoral staff and the elders over the next uh, two weeks to sort of finish, finish our, uh, our thing on that. Okay? Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.